Trump's former friend and colleague, Steve Bannon, trashing the first family. Excerpts from Fire and Fury allege Bannon called Ivanka dumb as bricks and Donald Trump Jr. unpatriotic and a traitor. President Trump first issuing an epic smackdown. First with this presidential statement, quote, Steve Bannon has nothing to do with me or my presidency. When he was fired, he not only lost his job, he lost his mind. Then days later, tweeting, I authorized zero access to White House, actually turned him down many times for author of phony book. I never spoke to him for book, full of lies, misrepresentations, and sources that don't exist. Look at this guy's past and watch what happens to him and Sloppy Steve. Sloppy Steve, just the latest on his roster of nicknames. Here to sort all this out, former Obama State Department spokesperson and Fox News contributor Marie Harf and former Trump campaign manager Corey Lewandowski. <laughs> so, Corey, I don't know what's true and what's not true from this book. Half of it's gossip, half of it's innuendo. The guys in Michael Wolff's own industry, the writer, he gets basic details wrong. Wrong. Sloppy. He may not be super reliable. And then Wolf himself admitted that some of it's really not accurate. So how do you see it? Well, I see this as a, as a piece of tabloid fiction, what this book is. And look, Michael Wolff has no credibility. When you've got publications like the failing New York Times and CNN saying that it's sloppy and it's not accurate and that Business Insider is saying that the own author admits that basically part of this is made up. I don't know why there's even any credibility to this book whatsoever because I know candidate Trump. I know President-elect Trump, and I know President Trump, and the stories that are in this book are so factually wrong, yeah. it shouldn't even have been published. So one of the stories was that he didn't even know who John Boehner was, Marie, and then there's a photo on the internet of President Trump playing golf with John Boehner. So have you sorted this thing out? You must be really, really looking forward to this book because it's so salacious. No, I think that some of the stories clearly are a little far-fetched, but he has a lot of people on the record. He has a lot of sources saying things that fit with a pattern we've heard of other reporters who cover the White House, that the White House was in chaos, that Trump is erratic, he's emotional. We see that. Just look at his response. So I don't think we should discount everything in this book. I think that would be a mistake. Okay, yeah, some of it's true, some of it's not true. It's so outlandish. One of the things, Corey, was that the president or president-elect didn't think he was going to win. He didn't think he was going to win, and then his wife Melania cried when he won. <laughs> Everybody knows, if not anything, that Trump is a winner, and all he well, wants look, to Jesse. do is win. <laughs> Jesse, he always wins. And for a, you know, li listen, you want to know somebody who didn't want to win? Hillary Clinton, because she went into hiding about 15 different times during the campaign and she couldn't be on the campaign trail. Donald Trump was out doing six and seven and eight events a day to rallies of 10 and 20 and 30,000 people, including on the day before the election where he was in New Hampshire and then he flew to Michigan and he did his last rally at two o'clock in the morning and got back to LaGuardia at three o'clock in the morning on election morning because he wanted to win. He put his own resources into this. His family put their heart and soul into it. And he's now delivering for the American people. And the difference is the only person who wants to say he didn't want to win was this liar, Wolf, who didn't have, look, he says he has people on the record. Release the tapes, Wolf, because I think you're a liar. Can you just say LaGuardia again with the New Hampshire <laughs> accent, please? Hey, it's, it's my half New Hampshire, half Boston. It's LaGuardia, baby. <laughs> LaGuardia, baby. Right. All right. So, and, and listen, they did, Marie, bring this guy in to the White House. I guess he didn't do Absolutely. a one-on-one -on -one with President Trump. Mm -hmm. They did bring him in. Some of the stuff I just want to read to the audience. This is fake news. I'm about to say <laughs> fake news. But there's an excerpt that people are saying is from the book. It's not from the book. But this is how ridiculous it is. You ready? On his first night in the White House, President Trump complained that the TV in his bedroom was broken because it didn't have the Gorilla Channel. To appease Trump, White House staff compiled a number of Gorilla documentaries in a makeshift Gorilla Channel broadcast into Trump's bedroom. Staff edited out the parts of the documentaries where gorillas weren't hitting each other, and at last the president was satisfied. People think that is part of the book, 
because everything else in the book is so crazy that they believe stuff like this that goes viral on the internet. But some of it's not actually that crazy. And, and you're right, he was given a lot of access. The White House press staff brought this guy in, hours of meetings. I, you know, he may have tapes, he may have notes. And these are people that he interviewed. They're supposed to be President Trump's friends. They're supposed to be part of his team. This isn't Democrats like me out there saying well, this. this. I don't think Steve Bannon sloppy Steve the... Bannon was being very friendly when he went against but, but the family. But these are people that are supposed to be on Team Trump. And it's not just Steve Bannon. It's Katie Walsh. It's others. It's, it's hosts of sources that are in this book. The Team Trump should be worried if this is how they're talking about each other you already. You know who else should Jesse, be worried? Jesse, hold on, hold on. Corey, Corey, you know who else should be worried? Crooked Hillary. Because <laughs> I knew that was coming. <laughs> here's why, Marie. Yes. They are opening up multiple investigations into Hillary. They're going after now the Clinton Foundation for pay to play. They're reopening the email investigation after 18 classified emails were found on Wiener and Huma's laptops. They're looking into Uranium One and they're possibly looking into the Hezbollah situation when they went soft on Hezbollah in order to get the Iran deal through. So, Corey, I want to play you some tape and uh, you can see if this is actually going to happen. Roll it. Remember this chant? With all these investigations going, could we see Hillary locked up? Well, Jesse, what I think we're going to find is that there is a real deep state in this government and the members of the FBI who are leading the investigation to Hillary Clinton some of them had financial ties to the Clinton operation. Some of them rewrote the wording. What we've now seen is that just recently, Senator Grassley and Senator Lindsey Graham have said that it looks like uh, Chris Steele, the MI6 agent who was paid by the Clinton campaign, at least some money by the Clinton campaign, to go put together this dossier, is now going to be indicted, it looks like. And so wow. there will be accountability. And what I think we're going to find is that this accountability will go to the highest levels of the Clinton campaign because they've tried to say that there was some pot of money by some Clinton attorney who could use this and nobody else in the Clinton campaign knew about it. I don't think that's true. I think Clinton knew that the emails had potentially been hacked from her server. We knew that. We knew that Anthony Weiner, who's now in a, in a federal prison somewhere, had access to classified information. And there's been no accountability because those FBI agents gave Cheryl Mills and Huma Abedin and Hillary Clinton yeah. a pass. And there's two different sets of rules for different people. I mean, it's pretty clear there are two <laughs> different sets of rules. If this was anybody other than a Clinton, Marie, they would have been locked up. I don't think that's true. It look, is true. I, I just disagree with you on this, Jesse. And, and DOJ, career people, looked at all of this multiple times. And I think Republicans just don't like the outcome. And it's not how it works, though. If you don't like the outcome politically, you get to keep reopening investigations. That's actually not how our judicial system works. Well, have works. they investigated the Clinton Foundation yet? I don't believe they I, have fully. That issue has been... All of these issues, they were part of congressional investigations, multiple congressional investigations, DOJ. This has all been looked at. Oh, so you're saying that they've already investigated, they've investigated the Clinton all Foundation of this. pay for play and they've all of deemed everything's on the up and up? Because I don't believe that's true. We have answers to all <laughs> of to, to these questions. And a lot of things Corey just said are not true. It's not true that Christopher Steele's about to be indicted. I don't know what he's thinking about, but just because two senators say he should be looked at for an investigation doesn't mean he's going to be indicted. But we don't know that. It could it could very well happen. It could very well not happen. But There's no evidence that it will. Okay. We have to stick to what we know, what, what, Jesse. What, 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 what we ahead. do know, Jesse, here's what we know. What we know is we had an American sailor who took six pictures on a nuclear submarine who spent a year in jail because of the way that the Justice Department went after him. And we know that Hillary Clinton's server has been, it seems to be, was compromised that is by not foreign true. assets. That is foreign, we false. do know that. We it do is not you know why? know because that. It, was, it, is it true. was sitting, her her server was sitting in some guy's bathroom, and Hillary Clinton said the Secret Service was standing outside the bathroom to protect it, is so farcical that it's amazing, and we now know that some foreign entity seems to have breached that server. Why are you still fighting 2016, Corey? Get over Hillary. Because Move there's on, accountability. Buddy. Because Move when you, when you, leak, Give it when up, you man. leak classified information, when you leak classified yes, information, I've worked in the government with country, classified information. I know how you so handle it. Okay, have you? Listen. That's right. And clearly, then, then you should have given a license to Hillary Corey, Luma, they don't I think what's happening is, is that Trump is using these investigations as leverage because if they're going to turn the screws to him on this bogus right. Russia right. collaboration, he's going to say, oh, you know what? Let's go reopen the Hillary investigation. You guys want to play dirty? You're right. We're going to play dirty, too. And you know what? That's politics. 
And that's Absolutely. how it goes in Washington. Now, I want to talk about the war of words between the U.S. and North Korea escalating this week. Kim Jong-un saying he has a button to launch nuclear weapons that could strike the U.S. at any minute. President Trump hit back, tweeting, North Korean leader Kim Jong-un just stated that the nuclear button is on his desk at all times. Will someone from his depleted and food-starved regime please inform him that I, too, have a nuclear button, but it is a much bigger and more powerful one than his, and my button works. But the president's tough talk is setting off his critics in the mainstream media. He's being cavalier in a way that makes him seem demented and deranged. This is dangerous. This is childish. This is unpresidential. It's not befitting the leader of the free world. Perhaps never have we seen a man whose profound uh, sexual and masculine insecurities are literally threatening to annihilate the planet. None of this normal, none of this acceptable, none of this frankly stable behavior. So, did you read any sexual insecurities into that tweet, Marie? Because I didn't. Really? This is the same president who talked about the size of his hands during the campaign. He likes everything. I think his opponents brought that he up. Likes I don't everything think he likes everything. He likes everything to be bigger and the best. And this is just who he is, right? He talks about his buildings and his business. Fine. That's not how you talk about nuclear war. And I don't want to be one of these Why Democrats isn't it appropriate who has her hair on fire about this. For the but president of the United States to publicly humiliate this so-called leader in North Korea when it comes to the nuclear arsenal. Because if that public humiliation, which may feel good to all of us as Americans, if that miscalculates us into a war, into a conflict, because there's a crazy leader in North Korea who doesn't know how to read Donald Trump's tweets, yeah, that's concerning to me. There's a better well, way to deal I with North Korea. I think what's more concerning, Corey, is the <laughs> fact that the last administration did nothing on North Korea and let this president <laughs> have to handle it. Jesse, you're exactly right. What you have to remember is for eight years, the Obama administration did absolutely nothing. They basically allowed North Korea to promulgate nuclear weapons, which is what this administration is now dealing with. And even Trump's critics have said it is time for a different approach to North Korea because for 30 years, what they've done in Washington hasn't worked. And what this president has said, and he's been very resolved in it, if you launch a missile at Guam or a U.S. territory, we will respond in kind. This is not a president who should be taken lightly. This is not Barack Obama who will draw a line in the sand and let someone walk over it. This is a man who speaks the truth. And North Korea has to understand there are consequences. And the United Nations has to act in a capacity that says the world is watching you. And that's what the president has been doing. And that's the pressure he's put on North Korea. I, I just want to show the level of panic uh, on the left, Marie. Uh -oh. Here's some guy over at CNN. I think it's Brian Stelter. He was so alarmed that the president was tweeting about the nuclear button. He actually contacted Twitter. Let's take a listen. I've asked uh, Twitter spokesman, does this violate Twitter's terms of service, uh, making this kind of threat toward North Korea? I think they're trying to decide if this kind of tweet, referring to a nuclear button that he knows how to use and it works, whether that actually is a violation mm. of the terms of service because it may threaten violence. So you have CNN reporters tattletaling on the president of the United States for a tweet. Look, Jesse, Come on. Jesse, they need to go back. They need to go back to the marijuana smoking on election night. That's what they're doing <laughs> off air, clearly, with this guy, right? Because they yeah. were doing it This air. is scary, though. This is not like a big joke. North Korea has nuclear weapons. So does the United States. And I really, this is going to be the biggest security threat we face in 2018. And I want President Trump to act like an adult and not try to resolve it on Twitter because it makes, honestly, it makes me scared, too. Well, I don't know how mature the last administration was. It's not so always I don't a know if you want to throw though. around things it's, like mature It's not always immature. a competition. You can say, I didn't like Barack Obama, and also say maybe Donald Trump shouldn't be tweeting like this oh. about North Korea. You know that what, what, your what, approach what did didn't Obama work. What did do to solve the North Korea problem? You know nothing. that your did approach didn't work, so problem. now a new approach is being tried. But guys, we got to run. And <laughs> the button is bigger on our side. Oh. Just lets everyone notice that. <laughs> Thank you, guys. My nominations for the Fake News Awards, up next. The Fake News Awards, that's the subject of tonight's Waters Words. On Tuesday, President Trump tweeted, I will be announcing the most dishonest and corrupt media awards of the year on Monday at 5 o'clock. Subjects will cover dishonesty and bad reporting in various categories from the fake news media. Stay tuned. The president is very busy, so we wanted to help him out. Therefore, 
Water's World is nominating Newsweek senior writer Kurt Eichenwald for an award. Kurt caught our attention with these tweets right before Donald Trump's election. In preparation for a completely unpredictable Trump presidency, I sold all stocks in my kids' education accounts today. I urge you to do the same. Ouch. And more. I hate to say this, but against my investment advisor's recommendation, I sold all stocks and went all cash months ago, just in case. <laughs> now, the Dow just soared past 25,000, and Kurt missed out on a 30% stock market rally under Trump. This would be one of the many mistakes Mr. Eichenwald made this year. While posting some hate mail he'd gotten on Twitter, Kurt accidentally posted porn that he'd been looking at. The Newsweek reporter tweeted a screenshot of his computer with a tab open containing animated Japanese pornography. Here was his explanation. Sigh. Okay. I'm a dumbass. I believe it or not, my kids and I were trying to convince my wife that tentacle porn existed. I tried to find some to show her it was real, but I couldn't find any and ended up with this. My family reads my Twitter feed so they know this is true. Who knows if this is true? But Eichenwald doesn't always tell the truth. Check out this story he wrote. Ready? Right-wing extremists are a bigger threat to America than ISIS. False, Kurt. Over the last 15 years, radical Islamic extremists have killed more people in the United States than right-wing extremists have. Look it up. Kurt also accused Trump supporters of booing astronaut John Glenn at a rally. Here's his tweet. Trump supporters booed John Glenn when Trump mentioned his name at today's rally a real American hero who risked his life for us. They booed. Fake news, Kurt. Footage of the event shows Trump supporters weren't booing Glenn, but booing protesters who were heckling the president. Kurt was forced to retract the tweet later, but it had already been retweeted 4,000 times. That's literally how fake news spreads. Eichenwald himself went viral after he claimed Donald Trump was institutionalized at a loony bin Years ago, without any proof, Tucker Carlson challenged Eichenwald to back it up, and sadly, he could not. It's you not said he was in a mental hospital in 1990. Was he or wasn't he? It's a really Tucker, simple question. If you don't I'm asking like you to the answer, please answer the if question. If you don't like the answer, don't have guests. But I would really like to answer your question. It's now, a simple question. Was he in a many, mental many hospital, years. as you claimed, or wasn't he? Tucker... Would you like me to answer the question or okay. not? If the answer is no, say so. Was he in a mental hospital in 1990, as you alleged, Let or was he not? Let me answer the question. Go ahead. You are... Look, you're not fooling anybody. You're trying to stop me from giving the answer. So let me give you the answer. This is a little nutty. So, I got to be honest. That actually went on for nine minutes. Nine minutes. This so-called journalist crossed so many lines this year, it's so hard to count. But here are two very egregious examples. You ready for this? Here's a tweet. Again, I rarely curse on this feed, but Kellyanne Conway now telling critics to be careful with what they say. F you, Kelly. This is America. Wow. And this one. Nobody tell me how to feel. Knowing if I lose my insurance, I'm dead. I want the GOPers who support this to feel the pain in their own families as ones with pre-existing condition, I hope every GOPer who voted for Trump care sees a family member get long-term condition, lose insurance, and die. F you and die. That's how a well-educated mainstream media reporter talks to Republicans. Now, Kurt likes to think of himself as well-educated, but continues to get humiliated by experts online. Here is Eichenwald pretending to be a political scientist. Quote, rage does not work as political opposition, moral high ground, peaceful engagement, asking respectful questions of opponents. These work. Do they really? The claim elicited this response. As a historian, I would like to say this is terrible advice. My evidence is all of history.
<laughs> and here's Eichenwald claiming he predicted Hurricane Irma. Ready? I'm not a scientist. I used a climate change equation and using sea surface temperatures, predicted Irma intensity, growth, and timing. 100% correct. Ready? Here's meteorologist Ryan Mao. He disagrees. I am a hurricane scientist, and this is BS. That's all. So between the dishonest reporting, embarrassing takes, and sloppy analysis, it is my honor to nominate Newsweek writer Kurt Eichenwald for the Fake News Award. Joining me now with reaction, media reporter and columnist for The Hill, Joe Concha. You think he's going to win? In, like, secretariat proportions, <laughs> 23 lengths Not after you laid that out that way. Can we just, I'll give up my time right now. Let's yes. play the other nine minutes with Tucker Carlson. <laughs> I know, wasn't that fascinating? It was fascinating. He would not give a direct answer. Because he couldn't, Jesse. Because he couldn't. Because he had no proof. But to say that the president, or before he was president, was institutionalized, and to have no documentation, and you're a reporter at Newsweek, wouldn't you think he'd be fired from Newsweek just for that? Just Forget for all the other FU stuff he's saying online and the, and the porn. He's also an MSNBC contributor, also writes for Vanity Fair. All of those publications <laughs> have to rethink this. But that is a microcosm of our media. Yeah. Whenever they make mistakes, even in front of three, four million people on Tucker Carlson's show, yeah. he couldn't show any contrition and say, you know what, I got that wrong. wrong. I'm sorry. No. G give um, me another shot. No. So and Tucker asked it about a dozen times. Now, highest defiance is the only term I could come up with. Would you like to nominate anybody for the awards? <sighs> You know, th this is a smaller example, okay. but I think it's indicative of what we saw in 2017, which you, you brought up during uh, your thoughts, and that is journalists or pundits playing doctors. Yes. Right? My yes. wife's a doctor. She went to school for a long time to become a doctor. Right. And Steve Schmidt was on MSNBC. Steve Schmidt was the campaign manager for John McCain in 2008, was on MSNBC last month. Mm -hmm. And he analyzed one part of one speech from President Trump talking about Jerusalem, and he got some dry mouth. And he began to, I wouldn't say slur his words, but when you get dry mouth, you sound a little yeah. funny, right? And he automatically jumped to the conclusion that the president was suffering from a physical impairment, that he had to get it checked out right away, and he had no proof of that. And he said, you know, the president needs to go to the VA and get checked out. And it never, and it turns out he's going there next week. Yeah, maybe he should go to the same mental institution that Kurt right. said he went so to. Stop playing doctor if you're a pundit from afar when you haven't analyzed your patient. Listen to these reporters. Now, I want to play a montage for you this is just from two days this week listen to the questions that sarah huckabee sanders is getting asked go can you tell me the biggest single thing the president has accomplished for the american people during his time on the golf course this is a serious question is the president now blocking steve bannon from calling his cell phone did the president's son donald trump jr commit treason that is a ridiculous accusation and one that i'm pretty sure we've addressed many times from here before I just a barrage of insane questions. Could you imagine if they ever asked, uh, was it Gibbs or any of the Obama press secretaries, what did the president accomplish on the golf course? I mean, he would be <laughs> that reporter would be run out of the room for daring to ask a question like that. There was a great poll. It was Pew or poll analysis they did of uh, coverage of President Trump, and they found that 74 percent concentrates on President Trump's character, yeah. and only 26 percent on policy. So you look at economy, jobs, right. healthcare, immigration, ISIS, and those three of those five, he at least gets A's for. They are at least obsessed in with his style, and they don't want to give him any credit for any of the policy accomplishments. Here's that way. And that's exactly right. I would also just quickly like to nominate Brian Ross for the tweet that tanked the stock market, and Rachel Maddow for that Trump tax exclusive that she held up. You remember that yeah, one? I remember. And that was like the Geraldo vault situation, <laughs> except Geraldo didn't know what was in the vault. That's and right. Rachel Maddow didn't. She hyped that like Mayweather McGregor. There it was, right there. So I, she, might, uh, she might get an award on Monday. All right, Good Joe, thank you very much. Good to see you. The war on weed is heating up. Are the feds coming for your stash? Joe's nervous. Up next. Live from America's Newsroom, I'm Julie Banderas. Good evening to you. The northeastern U.S. continuing in the strong grasp of a deep freeze. Cities like Baltimore, New York City, and Philadelphia all experiencing single-digit temperatures, something they don't see very often. The Mount Washington Observatory in New Hampshire, in fact, could see a minus 100 at some point today. 
Whoa, that's cold. It was the second coldest place in the world today, but there is a light at the end of the tunnel, folks. Monday is expected to be the first day above freezing in many areas since last month. Pro-government rallies continue for a fourth straight day in Iran. Thousands marching in a number of cities in a backlash against widespread anti-government protests. Iran's clerical establishment is blaming the country's enemies. 22 people have been killed this week, and more than 1,000 have been arrested. I'm Julie Banderas. Now back to Waters World. Thanks for watching Fox News Channel. I personally love to have a glass of wine and a couple tokes of a J, and that puts me in a really nice place for the evening. But a J is a joint, right? A J is a joint. So this is a marijuana cigarette? <laughs> and you smoke it through the filter? Yeah. Water's World Donut going down the hatch. Is the munchkin like the hole of the donut that they took out when they punched the hole through the donut? I, you know what, I would say yes, but no, it, no. <laughs> that was my can of bus tour in Colorado where weed is legal and now in California it's legal too. But Attorney General Jeff Sessions is cracking down promising to start enforcing the federal marijuana laws that the Obama administration ignored. Sessions famously stating his feelings on pot back in 2016. Good people don't smoke marijuana. Wow. Joining me now, CEO of Bang Holdings Corp, Steve Burke, and conservative commentator Dr. Gina Loudon, who is a member of President Trump's media advisory board. Is it is it bong holdings or, or no, it's bang? Big. It's okay. I just want to clear that up. Um, so you think it's good for states to legalize marijuana and you're terrified of Jeff Sessions coming in and ruining the party, I assume, correct? Well, here's what I'm telling my shareholders. The legal marijuana market is past the point of no return. The only thing that Jeff Sessions is doing right now by reversing the coal memo is galvanizing Republicans and independents that use medical marijuana and cannabis in their daily lives to vote blue in the next midterm elections. This is going to be a disaster for the GOP, and it's a disaster, and it's going to make Jeff Sessions the most unpopular man in America. Dr. Loudon, what would you say to that? Because, um, you know, a lot of Republicans are coming out and saying that Sessions is overstepping and the Republican Party is a states' rights party, correct? They voted for legalization in these states, you know? The people have spoken, yes or no? States' rights don't override federal rights, and we know that. Jesse, I understand when you have a lot of money invested in something like big weed owners do, these big corporate Wall Street types have tons of money invested that you want to defend it, but this isn't about the legalization of marijuana. This has nothing to do with that, in fact, and they're trying to cloud the waters to confuse everybody who's gullible to that sort of confusion. This is about the rule of law, and it's easily changeable. You hold here hearings and you change the law. But what Obama did, Jesse, and you know this, is he bragged about ruling by his pen and his phone and ruling by edict like a dictator. That's unacceptable. And Sessions is not creating any law here. He's simply restoring the rule of law to its proper place. Most Americans can no, agree with what that. What he's actually doing, Gina, what, what he's actually doing, Gina, is he's defying the president because the president was asked directly by a Colorado journalist whether or not he's going to use federal authority to come after the recreational marijuana market in Colorado. And this isn't that. And President Trump said, no, I will not do and this. And it's great because the so president Jeff Sessions is, is defying the president right now. Just like he said he would. The president made a commitment to the voters of America to restore the rule of law. We know that the last president used his pen and phone edict to create law. That is not constitutional. All the president is doing and all Sessions is doing is restoring the rule of law. If you want to change the federal law, yeah. then hold hearings they can and go do it and, legally. Right. They can go in and, I guess, reclassify how marijuana is determined on a federal level, and that can solve all the problems. But let me, Dr. Gina, play devil's advocate for the devil's lettuce here for a second. If you're a, an, an adult and you want to, you know, smoke up in the house and you live in Colorado, you know, it's America, it's, it's legal in Colorado, is that a big deal? Jesse, I'll tell you what. 
that would be up to the law. We have to do this legally. And you know what? This really isn't about that debate. I have a 15-year-old son that way before California uh, decided to legalize uh, marijuana as they have now, he asked to leave because all of his friends, he said, and I'm sure they didn't mean all of them, but most of them were doing weed and he didn't want to be part of it. This isn't even about that, though, Jesse. This yeah. is about big corporate Wall Street money that is invested yeah, in weed I know. and Listen, they're trying to change the There's a lot of money to be made off uh, recreational and medicinal marijuana. Marijuana. Um, I'll give you the last word, um, but I, I would also agree with Dr. Gina. You know, I wouldn't want my daughters smoking it. I, I wouldn't encourage that. Well, then that. let's look at the data, Jesse. The data in Colorado shows that teen and adolescent use is at an all-time low. It's a 10-year low right now. That's There's not true. There's data on this. The That's experiment, not true. Yeah, yeah, absolutely true. That's the not data true. And not shows only is that, that not true. The hospital's deaths are up. I, it, it, the criminality is affecting that's not all true. of the states that's, that's who, completely who haven't untrue. legalized the data it yet. Is that's there. another Listen, problem. We're not going to debate the data right now. Um, you know, if I did, I think everyone's eyes would glaze over. But guys, we got to <laughs> run. And I think everyone's the one, the one is big data safe point for is now. that two thirds of Americans want to vote, want recreational marijuana to be legal, Rule and marijuana is well, more popular than any Republican. Put it to right a vote now. then. Put it to a vote and make put it, it to a vote. Let's do legal that. under the federal law, guys. We got to go. Easy. We got to go. Thank Thanks. you. Thanks for having All us. Right. Scott Bayo is going to set the record straight over a White House Christmas party controversy. Right back. Our New Year's Eve broadcast was a big hit, but it wasn't without controversy. My buddy Stephen Baldwin was on and said this about fellow actor Scott Bayo. I just heard that they had uh, a new video come out from the uh, White House Christmas party, and uh, Scott Bayo yes. was there. And, uh, and I'm wondering, here I am with you, Jesse, <laughs> but I don't recall getting my invitation to the White House Christmas party, and, and there's Scott Bayo, and I'm sitting there going, wow! Now, I think Baldwin was talking about the Mar-a-Lago New Year's Eve event because we saw this video streaming through and all these people there, and he was jealous. Now, Scott, what, what actually happened? Where were you? I was at the White House with uh, the president and the first lady and about 500 other people. Okay, so you were not at Mar-a-Lago on New Year's Eve. I was not. Was he was he at Mar-a-Lago, Stephen? No, he wanted to be because he was oh, on he set with me at like minus oh, 10 I, and he was jealous. I got you. Yes. Well, listen, I'm you know, I'm better looking and more important than him. So, you know, <laughs> I, I got you got to do what you got to do in life. And I, I would have taken him as my date, but I don't think my wife would have appreciated it. <laughs> well, I mean, listen, it's 2018. The three of you guys can go together. I'm sure yeah. he would have been quite happy. All right. So yeah. um, how was the White House Christmas party, by the way? It, have you ever been to the White House, Jesse? I did. I went to the White House Christmas party for the press. I didn't get to go I, to the celebrity edition like you did. <laughs> I've never, I'd never been to the White House. It's, it's incredibly emotional. It's beautiful. Um, and it was absolutely amazing. The president, uh, you know, there was a podium set up and there was a bunch of people there. And he was talking and he asked some people to get up and speak. And he looked at me and he said, I know that uh, you don't like to do this. And I went, yeah, I do. Yeah, I, I like to do it. I, I do. He said, well, come on up. And I, and I spoke for about 30 seconds. And then he took uh, me and my wife and uh, about five or six other people up to the Lincoln bedroom. Mm. And it, it, it was it was incredible. You know, so it's a it's a once in a lifetime experience. I, I will never forget it. Baldwin is so jealous right now, man. After the I, crack about his looks <laughs> and now this Lincoln bedroom access. No, I take that. Oh, well, there you go. I, he never got back to me. <laughs> uh, he's, but listen, he's bitter. But listen, I, I got to tell you, you know, I was listening to your, to your previous segment with yeah. Marie Harf and whom, who I think would defend Hillary Clinton if uh, she was in the middle of Times Square with a meat cleaver hacking up people. She would say, no, I, no. Yeah. Um, uh, but look, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to help the media right now. OK, I'm going to try to help them. Uh, you sure because, that's a good idea? They might actually no, listen. Yeah, I, no, I think, I think I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try. It's not going to go anywhere, but I'm going to try to help them because they've okay. called the president... The president has dementia. Yeah. He's an idiot. He's not mature, according to Marie Harf um, and uh, any other name they want to throw at him. But Jesse, and you know this as well as I do, I'm from Brooklyn. President Trump is from Queens. This is what we do. Yeah. We mess with people. <laughs> that's it. And, that, after and, and that's years of messing with people, they still haven't 
gotten that that's what he does. They act surprised well, every time. It, it, it's amazing to me because they hyperventilate over things that he says. And he's just like, you said it earlier in, in, in the show, the, the button with Kim Jong-un, whatever. <laughs> yeah. The, 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 yeah. Little uh, Rocket Man. Uh, my, my Rocket Man. Right. <laughs> Rock man. Little button man. I mean, man. that's perfect. But that's perfect because he's mocking him. He's belittling him. And, right. and I got a bigger button than you. Right. Now, if Kim Jong-un responds, he looks like a child. He does. And Trump is Trump is just laying it out there. I, listen, the guy, I love the guy. Yeah. And he, and, he uh, and, and I don't think anybody's seen anything like him. And that's what, that's what I like about him because nobody knows what to expect from him. And it's awesome. It is awesome. And for the Democrats to say that Trump's a madman, they lost to a madman. How does that make them look? They can't even beat a crazy person. I'd rethink that whole line of attack.